Well, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> first of all, Lisa and I would like to express how grateful we are to be gathered together with most of you virtually and a few of you live on this beautiful wintry day. Now, did you find yourself silently singing along with those primary children as they proclaimed their membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in song? May I invite you to consider the simple words of the primary song we just listened to. What does it mean to belong to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Many of us are familiar with an expression, an expression used by a company in numerous ad campaigns. Membership has its privileges. Well, we're not a secular organization. We are the Restored Church of Jesus Christ. As such, if I were to articulate similar sentiments as a member of the church, it might sound something like, belonging brings blessings. And yet, there is more, isn't there? Belonging brings responsibilities as well. I have been rather thoughtful about this. Today, I would like to identify responsibilities associated with our church membership. I'll then discuss in greater length heavenly blessings given to us as members of the church, which enable us to accomplish those divinely appointed responsibilities. I quote, the work of salvation and exaltation focuses on four divinely appointing res appointed responsibilities. We come unto Christ and assist in God's work by living the gospel of Jesus Christ, caring for those in need, inviting all to receive the gospel, and uniting families for eternity. As we strive to fulfill these divinely appointed responsibilities as part of the Lord's work, the church provides a multitude of resources. These are blessings pouring down upon us from heaven. They come in many forms. Many are customized to our age, location, and circumstance. Some of these blessings result from covenants we make as church members. Others bless the lives of all of God's children. So I'd like to identify blessings available to accomplish that first divinely appointed responsibility of living the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of these is important to you, our accessibility to education. President Nelson remarked, I encourage each person regardless of age to continue to learn Pursue whatever path will be most valuable to you and your family. You will be blessed as you do this. You will grow academically, professionally, and spiritually as you seek to enhance your education. The church is a substantial provider of education, which prophets have consistently encouraged. As seen by your school's history, which goes back to the BYU Academy founded in 1875 by Brigham Young, the link between education and living the gospel of Jesus Christ became clear early in this dispensation. Today, there are over 30,000 students attending BYU. There are an additional 43,000 students who attend BYU-Idaho, BYU-Hawaii, and Ensign College. BYU Pathway Worldwide provides certificates and degrees to com completely online to, stu to students from over 150 countries around the world, many of whom otherwise might not have access to higher education. Its online enrollment is just over 50,000 students. Spiritual education is also provided to students around the world. Over 700,000 students are enrolled in seminary and institute classes. In aggregate, over 900,000 students are enrolled in some element of offering from the church education system. What a blessing accessibility to education is in helping members of the Church of Jesus Christ live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Similarly, members of the church are recipients of blessings 
which come through numerous other programs, curriculum, materials, and initiatives. Let's just talk about a few of these. Tens of thousands of young men and young women have attended FSY conferences in over 46 countries and in 20 languages. Come Follow Me curriculum in digital and print blesses the lives of millions of members who by necessity resulting from the pandemic are conducting home-centered church-supported gospel learning. Over 190 million copies of the Book of Mormon have been printed and distributed in 112 languages. The newly introduced children and youth program for members aged 8 to 18 teaches how to follow the Savior in all areas of life, spiritual, social, physical, and intellectual. Face-to-face -face events have been conducted for groups of all ages throughout the world. Lisa and I did a face-to-face -face broadcast originating from the Philippines for all of the youth in the Asia area, followed by an event in Japan which we were able to conduct in Japanese. Now, consider how the blessing of over 20,000 meeting houses populating the world is assisting us in our responsibility to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. The meeting house gives a place to gather, to participate in ordinances and to feel a sense of fellowship and belonging. Dedicated meeting houses come in a variety of shapes and sizes, adapting to numerous countries and cultures. Look at the bright countenances of members in Vanuatu at the dedication of a new meeting house in their village. In this simple, clean, dedicated space, members gather worship and conduct sacrament and other meetings. Similarly, a new meeting house was recently constructed and dedicated in Kiribati. This too provides a space for members of this little branch on their own little island, blessing them in their efforts to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about the second divinely appointed responsibility of uniting families for eternity, which would be impossible without the blessing of temples dotting the earth. Because it's in the house of the Lord that ordinances that bind families take place. Our dear prophet, President Nelson, leads and encourages our divinely appointed responsibility to unite our families for eternity. Besides encouraging temple worthiness and attendance, President Nelson is also announcing and overseeing the, buildings of, the building of temples at a prolific pace. This truly exemplifies the principle that belonging brings blessings. Consider the following invitation and promise. My dear brothers and sisters, the assaults of the adversary are increasing exponentially in, in intensity and in variety. Our need to be in the temple on a regular basis has never been greater. I plead with you to take a prayerful look at how you spend your time. Invest time in your future and in, and in that of your family. If you have reasonable access to a temple, I urge you to find a way to make an appointment regularly with the Lord to be in His holy house. and then. Keep that appointment with exactness and joy. I promise you that the Lord will bring the miracles He knows you need as you make sacrifices to serve and worship in His temples. And so here is a dramatic demonstration of the blessing of temple proximity. When President Nelson was born in 1924, there were only six operating temples in the church worldwide. Sixty years later, in April 1984, when he became an apostle, there were 26 operating temples. With President Hinckley's inspired vision to build more temples, by 2000, there were 100 operating temples. There are now 168 operating temples in the world. 
But when the 35 new temples that are currently under construction and the 28 announced temples are completed, the total number of operating temples worldwide will reach 231, and it's estimated that 81% of the members of the church will be within three hours traveling distance to the temple then. To further demonstrate the blessings we're enjoying as members, let's go on a journey. Beginning in 1979 with President and Sister Eka, who were called as president and matron to the Abba Nigeria temple in 2019. This is a picture of the beautiful Eka family. President Eka joined the church in 1979 in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Following the baptism of Sister Eka two years after his baptism, they looked forward to the day when they could be endowed and sealed in the temple. And this took place in the faraway London, England temple, an 11-hour international flight from their home with little chance of returning there to attend again. The dedication of the Johannesburg South Africa temple by President Hinckley in 1985 was a great blessing as it created the first discrete temple district on the African continent. However, from Port Harcourt, driving nearly 4,000 miles one way through eight countries taking more than one week to Johannesburg was almost impossible for them. Over the next 20 years, President and Sister Eka were able to attend the Johannesburg Temple only twice. You can just imagine the joy they felt when the first temple in West Africa was dedicated in 2004. President and Sister Eka were now in the Accra, Ghana Temple District. They felt like this temple district was almost next door, yet it was still a two-day drive of 18 hours one way, just over 650 miles away from their home. Twenty months later, the Abba Nigeria temple was dedicated. Now, they felt this temple was so close as if in their own backyard. President Eka was set apart as a sealer on the day the temple was dedicated in 2005 by President Hinckley. Now, with the temple so close, just under a two-hour drive away, President and Sister Eka have attended there twice a week since its dedication except for the three years while they presided over the Nigeria Lagos mission. From their mission office in Lagos, the drive to the Abba Nigeria temple was just over 10 hours. Of course, when the Lagos Nigeria temple is completed, which was announced by President Nelson in October of 2018, the miracle for all members in Lagos will take place once again for them, as it did for President and Sister Eka. Well, let's now consider the third divinely appointed responsibility, inviting all to receive the gospel or missionary work and the heavenly blessings we receive to accomplish that work. Samuel Smith was called in June 1830 as the first missionary in this dispensation. Hundreds of thousands of missionaries have served since that time. In August 1852, my fourth great-grandfather, William Holmes Walker, married with children at the time, was informed a mission call for him had been announced in a special church conference with instructions to depart as soon as possible to Cape Town, South Africa. He and his companions, Jesse Haven and Leonard Smith would be the first missionaries to serve in Africa. He served almost five years on that mission. He left his family traveling for three months by horse and wagon to New York City, then sailing 18 days to England. Preparations in England to go to Africa took two months. Boarding a boat in Liverpool, he sailed another 66 days for Cape Coast, Africa. From the time he departed Salt Lake to the time he arrived in Africa was 216 days. Today, that seven-month journey takes about 25 
hours by plane. Aren't we grateful for the example of early missionaries of this dispensation for their considerable sacrifice for the work? My father, Evan Stevenson, was called to serve in California and Arizona in 1947. Death Valley was one of his areas. Within days of his arrival to his mission, his mission president announced that from that time forward, all missionaries would proselyte without purse or scrip. This meant that they moved out of their apartments and sent virtually everything home. They could spend no money. They were instructed to receive meals and lodging from the people they were teaching. At the end of two or three days, they were to find new investigators or contacts to both teach and from, from whom they might receive meals and lodging. Can you imagine this? Again, we express our gratitude for the faith and consecration of missionaries who preceded each of us. I received my call and assignment to serve in the Fukuoka Japan mission. Here I am with my father and brother opening my mission call letter. And now, a few years later, here I am boarding a train from my last area on the day that I completed my mission. It seems that each generation of missionaries are blessed to be able to stand on the shoulders of those who preceded them. Now, this is a common scene prior to the pandemic. Just about one year ago, there were approximately 68 thousand missionaries serving at that time. Missionaries were out among the people engaged in traditional proselyting activities. Many had completed their MTC experience right here in Provo. Others may have been in one of nine other active MTCs, such as the Philippines. One year later, in spite of the worldwide pandemic, the work moves forward. Missionaries are diligently following local COVID guidelines in the area they serve. In some instances, they teach outside, socially distanced. In other places where greater restrictions are in place, missionary teaching originates from missionary apartments done virtually. For several months now, newly called missionaries have completed their MTC training in an online virtual framework from their homes. The diligence of missionaries with the support of their families and the combined work of members combined with church resources blesses us to fulfill the di divinely appointed responsibility of inviting all to receive the gospel. Belonging truly brings blessings. Now, the fourth and final divinely appointed responsibility as members of the church of Jesus Christ is caring for those in need. Remarkable blessings in the form of resources are available to us, enabling the care for those in need. Church support includes critical immunization campaigns around the world, including an important role in helping get COVID-19 vaccinations to those who might otherwise go without. The church has provided significant support to displaced populations of refugees from the Middle East, including Syria, Yemen, and Iraq, and Sub-Saharan Africa. This aid, this aid ranges from basic relief and shelter supplies for emerging, emerging crises to educational support for more prolonged situations. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, church humanitarian efforts in 2020 have been by far the most extensive in our history, comprised of hundreds of projects spanning 151 countries, including over 28 million items of personal protective equipment. 1.3 million medical items as ventilators and thermometers, 2.1 million hygiene kits, food items for an estimated 4 million beneficiaries domestically and abroad. 
And finally, <clears throat> the worldwide impact of the pandemic unfortunately did not spare us from other natural disasters. In addition to COVID-19, church funds and volunteers were drawn upon to respond to an undiminished number of natural disasters. In many of these instances, it was once again our members who were the heroes, donning their yellow vests, now accompanied frequently by masks, and braving the conditions of the pandemic to continue to provide the selfless post-disaster relief efforts that they have come to be known for. God sent the crew. I believe in God and I know it's of God. And this crew here, taking other trees that's down in the yard, and God knows I appreciate that. In a period of six weeks, three hurricanes struck the Gulf Coast from Southeast Texas to the Florida Panhandle. With each disaster, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints organizes before and after to provide a helping hand. And here's how. Once we see something brewing in the Atlantic or in the Gulf, we'll try to determine where command center should be set up. As a command center staff, we start showing up at least Friday by noon. You guys are making calls, right? We coordinate with the Bishop's storehouse for the truck to arrive so that the supplies can be unloaded and staged properly. We've learned that the full-time missionaries is a great resource. <laughs> this disaster has allowed them to get into the community, but also feel like they can give service. Thank you so much for this opportunity to help you. OK, so I'm going to give you this one. Once the volunteers start arriving, Two young men. the engine that you've built, so to speak, we anticipate the fuel coming, and the workers is that fuel. Uh, they start coming, and boy, they're just happy to be there. I recognize you. How are you? You doing all right? I've taught him everything <laughs> you know. It's amazing to see the unification that happens when a stake or a ward donates volunteers. Number 97. 97, okay. Okay, so mostly trees and tarp. They become unified in the gospel. All age, race, color, all those divisions are wiped away. This tree right here is the one that fell on my house. And I was in the bedroom when it fell. And I called for help and they came and helped me today, which was such a blessing. After one of these storms come through, it makes you feel like your whole life is upside down. And the, to be able to see the emotions and the people that were helping and uh, you know, just a really very spiritual, emotional day. You hear those stories and it just makes it worthwhile. All the setup that we do through a command center. We're well known now after disasters. They know that the Latter-day Saints will come. Well, let's summarize. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have been given four divinely appointed responsibilities. Living the gospel of Jesus Christ, uniting families for eternity, inviting all to receive the gospel, and caring for those in need. And so I would like to invite each of you to consider your role in accomplishing these divinely appointed responsibilities. How do you anxiously engage in this work? As you do so, I promise you'll be humbled. You'll be overcome with joy in recognizing and enjoying heaven-sent blessings, blessings from heaven for you to accomplish each of those elements of this work. I'd like to bear my witness of these principles of which we have spoken today, of the great blessings that come from belonging 
and the great responsibilities attendant to those blessings that we receive. And I would like to bear witness to you, brothers and sisters, that the heavens are open. That God the Father and Jesus Christ in this dispensation opened them once again as they appeared to Joseph Smith just exactly the way that he said they did. I bear testimony of God the Father, of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Ghost, of the divine doctrine of the Father, which is that he wants all of his children to return to his presence, of the divine doctrine of the Son that enables us to glorify the Father in his doctrine by returning to him through the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I bear my witness to you today of living prophets and of the sacred, the divine role of, our, of Jesus Christ, his role as our Savior and Redeemer. I offer that testimony and witness to you in his holy name, even Jesus Christ, amen.